Good afternoon and welcome. We're a small crowd, but it's really great to see you all. I'm Barbara McClure. I'm an instructor in the English department, most recently teaching at the Petaluma campus. I'm also a colleague and a friend of Jean's. It's an honor to be able to introduce her today. Jean was born and raised in Pullman, Washington, and after being hired at Santa Rosa Junior College in the English department as a full-time instructor, she became a Northern Californian and continues to reside here. Um, Jean is the author of four books, The Life Within, uh, Windfalls, Into the Forest, and her newest novel is Still Time. Many of you probably already know that Into the Forest was adapted into a film and premiered at the Toronto Film Festival um, this past summer. Wrong location, oh. right. <laughs> um, it also stars Ellen Page and Evan Rachel Woods. Um, Jean just recently came back from France. Her novel had been translated into French and has been for over a month now on, I should have announced that other time. <laughs> um, she's been on the bestseller list in France for over a month now. <laughs> the North Bay Bohemian has just um, elected her as Sonoma County's Author of the Year as well. So this afternoon, Jean's gonna to talk to us about her writing process or writing in general, and she's going to do a reading from Still Time, and we'll end with questions, and, uh, questions that you might have. Um, while Jean is a talented artist and a gifted teacher, she, to those of us who know her, and it sounds like a lot of you do, she's also an extraordinary human being. So welcome, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, um, arts and lectures. Thank all of you for being here um, when there are so many other places that you could and should be. <laughs> One place that we all um, should be right now is um, uh, over at the Student Activity Center where um, Chase Iron Eyes, the uh, American Indian activist, water protector, attorney, politician, and member of the Standing Rock Sioux um, tribe is talking about um, the Standing Rock, Rock water protector's resistance to the um, Dakota pipeline. And um, fortunately that's being taped. So um, I'm, hope, I'm looking forward to watching that very much, and I'm hoping that you'll all have a chance to check that out, too. Oh, wait. Um, I'm not friends with this thing. Projector is off. Help. Doesn't matter. Um, Those of us, I just wanted to say in, in relation to the um, to um, Chase Iron Eyes presentation today, that those of us who care about this planet and each other and the arts and science and truth have a lot of important work to do these days. And, um, and I'd like to think that art helps to sustain and inspire and activate us to do that work. Um, so that's, that's um, a reminder to try to watch um, Chase Iron Eyes um, uh, presentation too. Um, I also want to thank um, 
Lori Kurabara, who, um, hi Lori, I think is down in Petaluma right now, um, taking a break and, and watching this, and Carmen Castillo and all the other people in the English department who sort of proposed this event and helped to make it happen. We have many fine writers in our English department, and um, there's a tiny little writing series for um, that is highlighting um, some of them this spring. Um, I had to miss, due to a death in the family and bad weather back east, I had to miss the first one, um, at which Terry Errett, Carmen Castillo, Claire Drucker, Abby Bullimoni, and Merlene Ray um, read. But rumor has it that um, they really, they it, it rocked, it was fabulous, and um, there's another reading coming up on April 26th in the beautiful reading room um, at the top of the library from four to six. Thank you. And um, Marco Giordano and Mark Bojanowski and Richard Speaks and Chris Cullen are gonna be reading. Um, I can't wait and I hope you guys will all try to make it there too. What I wanted to do today um, was talk a little bit sort of just generally about what it is that writers do, that serious writers do, and, um, and a little bit about sort of my own process and experience. Um, and then I want to read a tiny bit from my latest book, um, and hopefully we'll have a chance for some questions. And I promise I'll have you out by 12.50, so you won't be late for your next um, commitment. Uh, when I'm lucky enough to teach creative writing, I tell my students that, that serious writers do three things. And um, I, if, if those are things that my students already do, then they're serious writers. And if they want to be a serious writer, then if they do those three things, they will be. Um, by serious, I don't really mean that, you know, we never smile. Uh, <laughs> but I mean that writing is a, is a significant and important part of our nearly daily lives. Um, so um, if we're thinking about those three things, what would you think the first thing is that writers do? Close, close. What, yes, what's writing's best friend? What's the other side of the coin? I think first and foremost, we read. Um, and um, that looks like me, doesn't it? <laughs> there I am reading. <laughs> we read, and we read uh, for a number of reasons. We read because we love language, and we're sluts for story and plot. And we can't wait to get inside of other people's skins. We want to know other people's um, experience intimately and profoundly. Both people who are similar to us and probably even more importantly, people who aren't. And um, reading gives us a chance to have other experiences. We love how stories let us think and um, allow us to feel. We love losing and finding ourselves in books. I, I just had to include that slide because I adore it so much. Isn't that amazing? I, I think it was staged, but um, it was taken you know, in London in 1940, so um, there's, there's a bombed out library and there are readers still reading. Um, first and foremost, we love, we read because we love it. And um, I think then the secondary reason that writers read is because reading teaches us how to write. Probably more than anything else we do, te reading teaches us how to write. Um, it allows us to internalize sentence patterns. It allows us to, um, um, and story structures. I think that um, 
just like syntax is hardwired into our brains, the syntax of stories and the expectations for how stories work is hardwired into our brains. And at the same time, if we're serious about um, engaging in stories and engaging in language, the more exposure we give ourselves to stories and language, um, the, um, the deeper that wiring goes. And so one reason that we read is just to sort of deepen our, um, our understanding of stories and sentences and language. And I think we also read to educate our tastes. Um, we read to learn what we love, what we don't. Here's another slide for you. This is um, just, a, I, I just sort of threw this together over the weekend, and it's a kind of patchwork collection of the books that sort of came to the top of my mind when I thought about what are some of the books I love um, at this moment. Uh, some are books that I've loved for a long, 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 long time. There's my best friend, Charlotte's Web, um, and Pogo and The Hobbit. Others are books that um, have been important to me as a writer. Others are sort of some of the brand new, hot off the press things I just finished last week. There's um, Joan Frank's All the News I Need. There's... Um, Dora, um, uh, Dora Bruder's um, up by the um, Nobel Prize winner, Patrick um, Mondiano, which I just finished this week. Um, and so one reason that we read is to sort of educate our tastes and to let us know what we love, what we don't love, um, what we'd like, how that sort of um, in terms of craft, and also to give us a sense of what's missing from the long conversation of literature at this point. Toni Morrison said that she wrote her first novel, The Bluest Eye, because she wanted to read it. And I think that she was talking there primarily about um, her sense that that was a story that was missing from literature. It was one of... Um, uh, it was missing from what Adiche calls the single story, and she wanted to give um, all of us uh, more stories in that. So um, I think at least for a long time, for most of us as writers, this, this particular kind of learning is practically unconscious. We're just reading voraciously, reading, 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 and um, we're assimilating, not studying. Though at some point, I think most serious writers get to the point where we like to study too, where we like to really sort of examine the moves that a story makes and consider you know, how we might do similar things and whatever we're working on. Um, uh, do you see how Shakespeare is kind of at the center of this assemblage? <laughs> well, yeah. Um, uh, so, so many of you probably know that my most recent novel features a, um, a, Shakespeare, a Shakespeare scholar, and um, Shakespeare has kind of been at the center of my universe for a long, 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 long time. So. Um, it's sort of fitting that everything revolves around the complete works. Um, this assemblage is primarily fiction, and um, because I'm primarily a writer of fiction, and I'm also a great believer in the particular powers of fiction for um, allowing us to get outside of our own skins and experiencing other ex um, people's lives or other creatures' lives, and also for um, letting us think in a particular way. I love the way that fiction allows us to sort of chew on ideas. Um, but I could make a similar assemblage for poetry, for um, memoir, for nonfiction. Um, so uh, 
there are many, 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 many books that are important in my life that haven't made it onto this little patchwork. For, I was lucky because I grew up in a family of writers, and so I grew up being read to. Long after I could read to myself, I was being read to. My, you know, the, my mother read The Hobbit to me. Um, about the time that I discovered uh, Charles Steinbeck in the S section of the library. I think I was about 10. And um, back then, libraries, a thing that I loved about libraries was that... Um, the, the books didn't have covers. They didn't, they didn't have uh, art and covers on them. They were, just, they were just like this. So you had no idea what you were getting. You just, you, just, you just grabbed books off the shelf and they had a title and an author and that was it. And if you hadn't done much, you know, if you were just beginning as a reader, it was just like, like opening a Christmas present every time. And, you know, it was Steinbeck, I think, that, um, that really sort of started me off on my um, lifelong career as a reader. I'd wanted to be a writer before then. Um, for years, I read both voraciously and indiscriminately. I just, I just, you know, I'd go to the library and whatever was next, I would read. And... Um, I think, that, I think that was a wonderful education. I'm a lot harder to please now. <laughs> and I know my students have kind of um, uh, expressed that too. It's like they sometimes complain that hanging out with me means that all the, the men, many of the books that they used to read, they don't, or you know, the kinds of writers they used to enjoy, they don't really enjoy that much anymore. And my response is always, yeah, but when you find something that you love, you love it so much. And I think that's the great gift of, 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 of that kind of reading. Sometimes people ask me what my influ who my influences are, um, what writers or books have influenced me. And, um, you know, all of these guys, I'd say. But I think really the um, glib but honest answer is I'm influenced by everything I read. Everything I read teaches me something about writing. And um, the books I don't like are probably even more instructive than the ones I do <laughs> in terms of really learning about writing and what moves work and what moves don't and, wh and why. Um, I think the books I love inspire me and the books that I don't love as much instruct me. Uh, I love all the books up here though. So, okay, so what's the, what's the next thing that serious writers do? Yeah, right. So there I am writing. Right? <laughs> and um, writers, serious writers write, and they write a lot for a long, long time. Um, I think Hemingway said, we're all apprentices in a craft where no one ever becomes a master. And I think that you know, most writers sort of hit their peak, the peak of their career often, when um, their peers are retiring. I mean, it's kind of, a, you couldn't do that if you were a dancer or a basketball player. But it's a long, long apprenticeship, typically. And um, yeah, I've written seriously which means sort of as close to daily as possible for um, at least 35 years at this point. And like, um, like every writer I know, and like most of the writers I know about, um, I've had to fit, had to? I don't know if that's the right word. Um, been able to fit writing around um, the rest of my life around working, making money, teaching, raising children, um, caring for elders. You know, it, it really is a sort of in sickness and health, better and worse, richer and poorer kind of relationship, I think, that serious writers have with writing. We write, um, we don't wait until we're really feeling great and there's nothing better to do 
to write. <laughs> we write, you know, whatever the particular circumstances of our lives. And um, we write that much for a couple of reasons. One is because writing well takes lots of practice. It takes just enormous amounts of practice. And so we write and write and write and write and write in order to make um, uh, our writing as sort of responsive to the needs of a particular project as possible. Um, we write to learn and refine our chops as writers. Um, we write uh, because most our most reliable source of or inspiration comes from writing. So writing breeds writing. The more often we get to our desks, the more we find that we have to say um, when we're there, or the easier it is to say those things. Um, we write because habits are easier than discipline. And so if we um, are in the habit of writing every day, that inevitable resistance that comes from um, leaving the rest of the world behind and engaging very deeply in something so demanding is a little bit less. It's a little bit easier if it's just a habit, if we don't have to think about it. Um, and we write because it takes a lot of work to shape a book. Um, when we read a book that we love, it seems so inevitable, doesn't it? It just seems, it seems like every word is exactly the right word and that it's couldn't, we couldn't imagine it being any other way. And um, it's hard to remember that that sense of inevitability is, um, is the end of a process of great confusion and frustration and, um, and blindness. Um, let's see, just so that we can kind of uh, de uh, uh, destroy this myth, I wanted to show you. Um, that's my writing studio. This, and, and just, you know, so, so in, in the interests of full disclosure, <laughs> it's a little prettier on the inside, um, but, um, but it, you know, <laughs> It's, it's not that. <laughs> but it is quiet. It's away from the family. Thanks to all that black plastic, it doesn't leak in the winter. And um, uh, uh, there's a door that closes that people you know, have to open to get to me. For years when I was writing and I had children at home, I said that only smoke or major blood were adequate reasons for interrupting me while I was writing. <laughs> and, you know, this is the other side of the yard, so that worked pretty well. The other thing I love about this travel trailer is it's got, I, I, it, the tires are utterly flat. So it ain't going anywhere, um, except when you. Um, so now that you've seen how glamorous a writer's life really is, um, I want to remind you that that when we're writing a lot, when I talk about writing a lot, I'm really talking about this enormously sort of complex um, uh, group of activities. So I'm talking about thinking, which is like, looks like that a lot, um, and research, and um, revision and revision and revision, this complex daydreaming, um, all kinds of, um, and very, very recursive, so we tend to go back over um, our drafts again and again and again and deepen them and um, uh, streamline them and learn more and more about what it is we want to say and how we want to say it. Here, um, for example, is a, a page from a very early draft of Into the Forest. And um, uh, I don't think any of the writing, actually, on that page ended up in the final draft of the book. And um, there's a few little ideas that ended up in the final draft, but many more that didn't. Um, and um, 
this is another page from Into the Forest, and this is interesting because Into the Forest was published first by a, no, a small nonprofit feminist press called Calix, to whom I will be grateful for the rest of my life. And then after, it was published by Calix, uh, not long after, um, uh, it, uh, it was bought by Bantam, um, the big New York press. And the editor there, I asked the editor, well, are we going to be editing it again? And he said, well, no, I don't think so. And I said, well, would you mind if I did? <laughs> because um, I, you know, I'd been away from the book for about a year, and, and I had new ideas about it and new things I wanted to do. So, so this, is, this is sort of beyond the end of the writing process. Um, and here is... Uh, uh, an image that shows some of the drafts that it took to write into the forest. Probably about half of the drafts, because my process tends to be out. I, I uh, write a first, I, you couldn't even call it a draft, it's a first mess um, on the computer. So I'm just sort of throwing all my hottest best, brightest, most energetic, interesting ideas um, into sort of one big file. And then when it gets too big, when I've got hundreds of pages and I don't really have a sense of what, what's there anymore, I'll print off a hard copy. And I'll work through the hard copy until that's so messy that I don't really have a sense of what's there. And then I'll put it back into the, to the computer. So it's, it's sort of back and forth between a hard copy and, the, and working on the computer. So that's probably half the draft. I mean, it's probably, to be fair, going to be six of those big old boxes um, to write a book for me. And I think, I think for most writers, every now and then you hear about writers who don't take advantage of the um, creative process, but in, in terms of revision and development, but not many. Um, okay. Yeah, I think most writers begin, you know, even for a big old book, with kind of this tiniest seed, some sort of little question or ache or interest or image, uh, maybe a half-glimpsed person someplace, some sort of voice or idea. Um, for me, it's often a, a situation. So I, the situation comes first. You know, what if there were two young women abandoned, isolated in, in the forest? Um, what would they do? What if you had Shakespeare as the last sort of lens with which to try to make sense of a, of a full, complicated life. And from there I go about the long, long, wonderfully engaging process of, of um, thinking about what if and um, learning more and more about the characters in that situation and what would be sort of the most interesting stories to tell about them. Um, my writing tends to come fiction from three sources, and the first is experience, um, you know, because that's ultimately all I've got. The second is research, lots and lots and lots of research, um, because ironically enough, I have to be the expert on anything I write about. And so if I'm writing about Shakespeare, I have to like fake out the Shakespeare scholars. If I'm writing about um, uh, the use of native plants, I have to convince somebody who really knows about native plants that, um, that I too know what I'm talking about. So it's a great deal of research. And one of the great pleasures, I think, about being a writer, because um, once we leave college, we don't have a lot of research assignments often. And so it's a marvelous way to kind of delve deep, deep, deep into some interesting territory. Um, and of course, all that research is really giving me experience with which I can imagine my characters and their situations. And so imagination is the final um, sort of um, piece of that pie, um, experience, research, and imagination.
So I'm making it sound like it's a lot of work. <laughs> and um, yeah, it is. But uh, you know, and it's and it's it, it can be terribly frustrating and terribly confusing and terrible and and and. You, one can walk around in despair a good deal of time and with this kind of terror that, you know, we'll never be able to pull it off. And at the same time, I, I don't want to diminish the incredible satisfactions of writing and the incredible um, exhilaration of the discoveries that we make and the places we get to go and where our imagination takes us and the, you know, the thrill of of, of making a new connection or discovering something that you know, we think is gonna solidly work for a book. Um, I really can't imagine doing anything else. It's, it's just been such a, such a blessed life and um, I can't, I'm, I'm not over yet. So um, one of the reasons I love writing is that it uses every part of me. It, it um, requires that I be sort of as an imaginative and associative and kind of um, uh, wild as possible. And it also um, requires that I be kind of as analytically smart and sharp as possible. Um, it, it sooner or later has me engage with every emotion I've ever had or can imagine. Um, it allows me to sort of resurrect and recycle all kinds of wonderful details from my life. Never in a straight, you know, because I write fiction, it's like you cannot possibly think that um, anything in one of my books is like a direct experience of mine. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. But there's so much that I get to sort of um, uh, turn in to something to serve the story I'm working on. And uh, so it's all ultimately, despite all the frustration and hardship, a great profound pleasure. So the final thing, the third and final thing that I think that serious writers do is share their writing with um, other people. And it doesn't have to be lots of other people. It doesn't have to even be, you know, um, we don't have to be thinking in terms of publication. But ultimately, I think writing moves from this sort of sense of this, this personal, intimate sense of discovery to um, a need or desire or impulse to communicate. And so there's that sharing with other. This looks like us, right? Here we are. <laughs> um, and so um, often the first people we share our writing with are like, you know, our, our beta writer or beta readers, our, the, you know, writers group or the sort of trusted readers who we trust to sort of keep the little um, uh, flame alight when we show them something sort of very vulnerable and raw and new. Um, and um, later, um, often it's an editor. Um, I may differ from other writers, some other writers, in the respect that I love working with an editor, typically. Not, not every, every interaction with every editor has been good, but to have someone else take my writing as seriously as I do is a huge gift. Um, and then finally, um, often um, books or poems or essays or articles go out into the world um, and they're on their own. They're out of our control. They're like kids who've grown up with lives of their own. And kind of the exciting thing that happens at that point is that um, I'm no longer the owner or the only expert on what I've written. Uh, it's, it's sort of got a wider, richer life. Um, it's outgrown me. Um, can I read to you for a sec? Is that okay? Or like seven minutes? Okay. <laughs> Since I'm going to be a serious writer, I'll get serious here a little bit. 
Um, this is, so, so if books are like babies, wasn't it Barbara Kingsolver in Poisonwood Bible who said basically, you know, it's, it's the newest one that you've got to save first? I think she said that. And anyway, um, I, I do think that it's sort of the newest one that I always love the best until the next newest one comes along. So this is, this is a little bit from Still Time. And um, um, this scene is set in 1950 in a little, um, in a small town in the Central Valley of California. And um, the protagonist of this story, this, this Shakespeare scholar who's developed Alzheimer's, is um, thinking back on his life. And he still has access to those rich early memories. Um, not reliable access always, but, but it's there. And he's thinking back to sort of when he was first falling in love with Shakespeare. And um, that's all you need to know. Oh, and his, his dad is the um, owner of the largest hardware store in Kernville. So that's kind of what his father, the, the tiniest glimpse of his father. So this is John, and it says, it's a tale John's recounted many of times, many scores of times, a story so permanent in his mind that already the intervening years are dissolving. Already that story is watching, washing over him, already sweeping him out of the meaningless green room where he chafes and waits and tugging him along on its strengthening current so that once more he is back in his hometown, or rather, he is in his hometown still, still a lanky, yearning boy, still perched on the concrete step outside the office of Mr. Martini's Esso station, glad that the morning rush is over so he can take a load off until the next customer comes along. Holding a Snickers bar in one grease-stained hand and his brand new Folgers pocket edition of Romeo and Juliet in the other, he takes a hefty bite of candy and begins to read. Two, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. Romeo and Juliet is on the recommended reading list for UC Davis's English majors, and John has finished his freshman year determined to change his major from engineering to English. And then what? His father asked on John's first night home while the two of them sat together at one end of the dinner table, their plates filled with the slabs of steak and jumbo baked potatoes that were his dad's idea of a meal to welcome him back. His mother had been dead for over a year, and in his last few months at Davis, John had begun to believe he was finally becoming inured to that awful fact, to think with some relief that, as his father and brothers seemed to have already done, he was honoring his mother's memory by moving on in his own life. But that first evening home, his loss was as raw as ever, her absence searingly evident in the lack of salad or vegetables or even rolls, in the splay of unopened mail that covered what had once been her place at the table, in the carton of salt and the bottle of catsup that sat unabashedly in front of his dad. Opening a seam in his potato with his knife, his father asked, what on God's green earth do you plan to do with a degree in English? Read, John answered immediately. And though he had not intended to sound so glib, he'd seen how his father's fingers tightened on his knife, how the button of muscle at the top of his jaw twitched just a little. And teach, John added, slicing a bloody ribbon from his steak. Teach, his father echoed. He looked as if the word were a bug that had inadvertently landed on his meat. Teach. John agreed. Fitting the bite into his mouth, he leaned across the table toward his dad at a university, he added, trying to buttress his expression with a confidence he did not own. 
He had no idea what teaching at a university would entail, but in his freshman English class that spring, he'd seen glimmers of a challenge and a solace and a way of thinking that made designing dams and building bridges seem trivial in comparison. Is now our two hours traffic on the stage. Keeping one ear alert to approaching cars, John finishes the prologue and begins the first scene. Except for the bit of the Merchant of Venice he'd inadvertently read back in eighth grade, his experience with William Shakespeare has consisted solely of the play they studied each spring in his high school English classes. His high school teacher's attitudes toward the Bard of Avon have been both precious and pedantic. While the other adults in Kernville seem to consider Shakespeare to be somehow akin to canned spinach or cod liver oil, wholesome and improving, if not always very tasty. As a consequence, John has sensed more than seen the powers those plays possess, their magic having been well camouflaged by pop quizzes, forced searches for hidden meanings, and class readings whose only redeeming quality were the moments of accidental hilarity they offered, as when, at the end of Othello, the kid who'd been laboring over Lodovico's lines droned, Oh, bloody period and the whole class snickered. Or when Eddie Mitchell began Mark Antony's funeral oration by carefully enunciating, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your rears. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet was the play they read when he was a 10th grader and John had found it pretty stiff going. He recalls liking raucous Mercutio more than bland Romeo, and he'd been intrigued by Juliet's apparent zeal to lose her maidenhead, since, locker room bluster aside, in his observation, girls seemed more interested in obtaining letter jackets and consuming chocolate sodas than having sex. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Peeling back the wrapper from his brick of candy, John takes another bite. Strands of caramel sag between his mouth and the chocolate bar, and he gives the candy a deft twist to catch the dangling strings. Then, biting, chewing, swallowing, he reads his way down the page. He is surprised by how alive the first scene seems much more modern and immediate than he remembers it being in high school. The Capulet servants baiting the Montagues until a brawl ensues reminds him of the fights that sometimes erupt behind the bleachers after the football games. An old Capulet blustering and calling for his sword makes John think of his own father, provoking a smile that is part smirk, part grimace, and part rueful tenderness. So there's a little bit. Oh, thanks. Um, of course, one reason that the um, Folger edition that John is reading is more interesting than what he read in high school was he was reading one of those balderized, balderized versions in high school with all the sex bits cut out. Um, uh, which is what they did back then. <laughs> we've learned. <laughs> we rely on those guys now, but we've learned. Um, so, okay. I, I guess I would just say, you know, like most serious writers, um, I think if you write long enough, you, um, you have moments of great good luck, and you have also moments of many, probably less moments of great... Um, disappointment. Um, um, my first and fifth books have never been published. Uh, the contract for my third book was canceled by Bantam. I had to give back tons of money. Um, my 
Dear Lil Still Time was out of print on its pub date. So, you know, there's, it's, 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 it's quite a sort of career of ups and downs, I think for all of us who stick with it um, long enough. Um, the most recent thrill for me is this. This is um, in the Paris metro stations. There are ads for the, um, for the, um, the translation of Into the Forest. So that's a hoot. Um, uh, yeah. Do anybody have any questions, observations? Anything I can answer or react to? Yeah. What percentage of time is research as opposed to writing? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. I don't think I've ever thought about it that way. Um, you know, it depends on the project a lot. I I always have the great misfortune of of uh, coming up with ideas that sort of for me require a great deal of research. I mean, I wasn't a Shakespeare scholar. I was a Shakespeare affectionado and fan. And um, um, I have never been homeless. And there was a homeless character in, in one of my books. And I you know, needed to sort of get on, find ways to be on the streets and get that experience. Never been a ballet dancer. My ballet teacher, when I was in sixth grade, told me I needed to find something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, and um, so, you know, lots and lots, you know, just a, a, a beyond, above and beyond sort of getting the street names right and getting, you know, making sure that the Esso stations were actually in the 1950s and Snicker bars were a 1950s candy bar and, you know, all of those little things. Um, I would say 20 or 30 percent. Um, you know, really depending on the book. And, and it's an interesting kind of research because it's sort of more priming. The, I mean, all, sometimes it's just you need, you need a fact, like when were pregnancy, home pregnancy tests um, available? You know, you need to know that because obviously you, you can't have your character using one before they were available because somebody's going to know that. And it's going to piss them off and it's going to discount all the other brilliant, wonderful things that you're trying to say. Um, but often it's, it's sort of more um, uh, sort of nebulous than that. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to get a sense of what might be sort of interesting roads to go down or trying to get a sense of, you know, how a character might feel or respond in a certain situation. Um, I'll pay attention. That's a good question. Exactly. Percentage. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, number two. I mean, there's yeah, there's moments when you there's with those hopeful things where you think I might be getting close. Maybe I can actually pull this off. Maybe this really will be a book. You know, there's that moment. But then, like you know, that the that when I was tweaking it after it had been um, published by Calix, my agent has a story about uh, a, another one of the. Um, writers she represents, who was giving a reading at Elliott Bay Bookstore in Seattle. And um, after the reading, you know, she's signing books and people are coming up with their books. And before she would sign her name, she had to like turn to page 237 and make some changes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me if I, if I would allow it, you know. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're never really done. Yeah, yeah. How did the movie industry find me um, into the forest? The, um, it had been actually optioned twice um, before uh, Ellen Page. Um, and I love the story of how Ellen Page found it because she was the, the actress Ellen Page was the, was the person who sort of discovered the book and decided that, you know, it would be an interesting movie. And it was thanks to an independent bookseller um, up 
in, I think, Halifax, Nova Scotia, her hometown. And she has a bookstore she likes there. And she, the bookseller said, you've got to read this book. I think I'd make a good movie. And she's like, yeah, right, whatever, you know. But, 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 um, but, but that's a story. It was thanks to an independent bookseller that uh, Into the Forest um, leaped from Calyx to Bantam. Um, and um, so thank you, because I always like to put in a plug for independent booksellers um, and the incredible service they do for readers and writers and literature. Carmen. Uh, <laughs> Bless your heart. Um, um, probably, I mean, there's so many good craft books. There's so many good books about writing. You know. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> I do love talking about it, though. And, you know, the, 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 so the chocolate bar, it's like we've just made this discovery about mirror neurons, right? And so when you read the word chocolate or hear the word chocolate, the part of your brain that tastes chocolate is activated. I mean, it's magic. It's absolutely magic. Yeah, Terry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, guys. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, it does, and um, yeah, I I do. I mean, I think in terms of of plot, most often it's like I I want I want the plot that seems inevitable but uh, totally unexpected. So that has to be fresh in some way. And so yeah, I sometimes find myself, you know, and then thinking, oh, that's too much like like this or that or this, you know, particular strand, um, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there is that, that little little tension between, I know, and I know that students have said, you know, well, I don't want to read too much because um, I don't want to, um, I want to have my own unique, fresh voice, um, which I don't think is exactly what you're talking about there. But, but I think that um, we, we develop our voices through a sort of assimilating everybody else's voices. Um, and there are those sort of apocryphal, perhaps, stories about writers who end up sort of producing sentences or passages from somebody else's work that they, they swear up and down aren't plagiarism, but just that unconscious, you know, remembering. Um, but, 
Yeah, I know that when I'm writing a book, um, I tend to not want to seek out books that are very similar while I'm writing. And then, you know, it's like I read before, you know, just in my reading, and then afterwards, like when I was writing, you know, Windfalls about mothering, you know, and people were saying, oh, there's this great book about mothering and that great book, and I didn't want to read them um, at that point. So, yeah. How are we doing on time? I promised. I would let you out um, so you could get to your next commitment. So I don't want to, I don't want to like break my promise. So one more fast question, or but or leave, leave if you need to leave. But I'll, Abby, yeah. They, they both do. It's such a, it's such an intertwined thing, you know. I mean, the more I learn about characters, the more the plot seems inevitable, but there's also the most interesting story to tell, which would require a character to have a certain sensibility or, you know, uh, motivation or something, and so it's, it's, it's really this kind of, um, like, like getting the legs on a, you know, four legs on a chair, sort of all flat at the same time or something. So. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Oh, 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 my goodness, that's beautiful.